Many thanks, Danny, and I uh, hope you had a lovely Easter weekend. It's great to be here uh, this new week. And uh, really, I think our viewers are used to having one major big global story uh, sort of defining global markets. Uh, but what you're noticing right now is we're seeing uh, each country has sort of its own story playing out. In the U.S., we are seeing inflation data coming out tomorrow, and that sort of will determine whether interest rates will go up or not. So a lot of this, the stock market, if you look at the S&P 500, uh, they see there's some positivity. So it's it's going up. If you look at the Dow Jones, it's going up. So that's driving the American stocks, that expectation on data, on inflation, and what that will mean for interest rates. But when you go to the UK, it's more of what's happening in the fiscal side. They've announced a huge uh, budget, uh, plenty of spending cuts by Jeremy Hunt, uh, plenty of uh, tax rises. So that means the environment there will be a bit slow. And you're seeing the, the likes of the FTSEs are uh, losing quite a bit in terms of, uh, uh, of value coming down. But also there's a lot of geopolitics taking place with the whole Ukraine-Poland uh, situation. That exactly. fallout has really, really uh, sort of uh, played out. But I would say that big story really on data for the U.S. because we've said many times on this show what happens in the U.S. ends up affecting global markets. So even if you go to Asia, here in Africa, if you go to South Africa, JSC, a lot of people are expecting to see what those U.S. inflation numbers will go will be like, because if interest rates go up, then you might find more dollars leaving emerging markets mm-hmm. like South Africa, like Kenya. So I think that's the dominant story that will continue to play out, and uh, hopefully we'll see we'll, we'll be monitoring that. And when we circle back to Africa, how are the markets performing here? It doesn't it doesn't look as rosy as it is in in Europe? with the Nigerian Stock Exchange, the South Africa All Share Index, and the Nairobi Securities Exchange, the performance doesn't seem to, to mirror what's happening in, in the West. Uh, well, I think uh, there is that feeling, as I said, with the JSE, that uh, if there is a strong inflation data coming up and there is a likelihood of the Fed raising interest rates, then you might find quite a bit of dollars leaving these emerging markets. Mm. Therefore, you'll find there'll be the outlook will be very bearish if you like, because everybody will be like, oh, okay, if interest rates go up, dollar strengthens, all the money goes back to the West, and obviously the participation in the African bosses go out, they go down. So you would expect to see sort of like uh, uh, those numbers coming down. Any chance of recovery? Well, I think that depends on the numbers that come out tomorrow. If the numbers are not very strong, then people might be okay. Maybe uh, the party will continue a bit longer here, but mm-hmm. uh, a lot, a lot will determine on the data that comes out tomorrow. In the commodities performance, energy crude analysts had focused that it will hit the $100 barrel. However, we are seeing it holding steady at $80, even after last week's rally. Is there a slow demand or uh, consumption? Why hasn't it gained as much as it did when they announced the production cut? Uh, It's definitely a demand story. (coughs) If interest rates go up, then definitely the demand for fuel goes down. Um, and, uh, and definitely, I think investors are looking at that. And that's why tomorrow's data point will be very important. Um, so the expectation is if interest rates go up, e- economic activity slows down, and you'll find uh, fuel prices coming down. I think right now it's at $84.20. Uh, right. And I think that will continue. Gold, the same thing. Gold, yes. gold, gold gains when you know the dollar loses. Yes. Mm-hmm. But the dollar looks like it's, it might strengthen. And that's why you're seeing it coming now below that $2,000 again. Sort of that $2,000 becomes sort of like the vacillating point. So tomorrow I think will be a big day for commodities, for currencies, for stock markets, because it will give us an indication on whether we expect interest rates in the U.S. to go up. But interestingly, the gold, uh, gold finally broke the $2,000 uh, psychological point towards the end of last week into this week so it's actually been the big story the rally has been going up what's happened with the with the gold finally just breaking beyond that two thousand dollar mark that people anticipated for a very long time it always go to 1990 something then went back down again then so finally it broke what happened well remember the story we've been having about oil what's happening in the oil space and really um oil being denominated in other currencies mm-hmm. uh, besides the dollar. That really kind of had a dent on the dollar. But now with this new data coming out that there's possibly that the economy in America is still overheating and interest rates might go up, I think people are taking a different 
twist to it and that's why you're seeing sort of like the reversal of 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 it so what that really you're seeing it that you saw last week is actually sort of like uh being tempered and actually might even be reversed if uh sentiments that interest rates will go up is there any reason or any chance maybe governments are trying to show up on gold bars so so that kind of gives it more edge seeing that there seems to be this shift from the dollar dominance and trying to kind of farm up the currencies with something else more tangible well that story was during the rounds last week i think even our own business daily here uh, carried that story which i think over we'll here will uh, mention f- featured i remember seeing his quote somewhere in there <laughs> he can weigh in uh and, and i think the story that they ran was really that uh the cbk has uh, passed on uh, that opportunity to 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 build those reserves and like other countries mm-hmm. and then and, and that uh yes i think that 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 there are two layers to this i think uh the outlook on the dollar is significant and i think for a lot of people as long as the dollar looks um strong and it's going to continue its rally then you'll find some central banks particularly like in kenya where we at 3.6 uh, months of import cover mm-hmm. we, are, we are below the statutory limit where the, you'd imagine the priority is still on getting more dollars in fast mm-hmm. before on even thinking about other commodities Mi- Mr. Ohoro, the yeah. last time Kenya actually developed its gold stash was during Kibaki's government. Right. And we've had a whole 10 years of just they just went by the reserves of gold were not developed any further. Mm-hmm. What what do you think that would be the reason? I think a, a good part of that has to do with the fact that um one is we had a very strong uh, backing from the Chinese with the with the loan system where <clears throat> they could pretty much um self finance from from their own reserves and i think to a great extent in fact the the whole uh, road and uh, what is it, the road and rail uh, project for china has been in a sense a way of the chinese offloading the excess excessive uh, holding of dollars and the best way to do that is you know dollar is still a, even though it's a reserve currency it's still a, a fiat currency and uh, the smartest thing the chinese have done is to move to deplete the holdings of us dollars by converting them to co- to co- to um gold uh, to, not even gold actually to into projects okay. in terms of obligations to the rest of the world mm-hmm. and i think they've played a pretty smart game of that So that was one and so in a sense we didn't need and most of the, and that, and that's been the hidden story for Africa is that Africa didn't need hold the sort of um uh, what you call the reserve uh, reserve uh, holdings of gold that backs up their the currency if they were if they could get into an agreement with the, with the Chinese they could convert their holdings of dollars into highways expressways and double decker highways as you have in Nairobi. Right. That I think has played a big part and I think the unsung story for international uh, mon- mon- uh, monetary system for Africa is the fact that um, Africa has pretty much got away with not holding uh, big reserves of gold even though we are the biggest uh, producer of gold on on earth. True. If anything if Africa tomorrow woke up and decided as one nation, one country, one continent to base its currency on its own reserves i think would have the strongest currency on earth it's not going to happen anytime soon but uh, what we have an invasion from europe and the uh, us but uh, that would absolutely turn the turn the whole table on its head but do you think a gold holding from a state's point of view is something that's important uh it's important but i think that if you look at the britain wood institute the institutions and how it was set up it was so that uh, because of the issue of security of holding physical gold holdings for the last 70 100 years these most countries have kept their gold bullion in the in the federal reserve and that has created a particularly important advantage for the american economy because not only is the us dollar i mean i keep saying that america is the only country country on earth that can export its inflation because True. when it has a problem it just prints the dollars they go to the rest of the world we absorb it but america keeps going on and so uh, around about 1972 when uh, i think it was germany that decided to it wanted to call back its gold bullion from the from, us yes. federal reserve 
and uh, the Federal Reserve's uh, response was um, maybe come next week. And the very next day, uh, President Nixon uh, got the U.S. off the gold standard. Correct. That's a lot to say about how gold bullion is good, but if you keep it in in situ in, in countries, I know Iraq and Libya are good examples of that. There's also a, a security risk around that. Right. And, mm. and, and the agricultural sector, if you look at wheat, it has gone up. Sugar is going up finally again. Canola has been on a downward spin. Coffee has gone down. Tea is up. Price is down. Palm, mo- palm oil is still on a rally. What's, what's, what's influencing this movement within the agricultural sector? Well, I think uh, I think a big story has to be about China mm-hmm. and the reopening of China. China controls a huge demand in commodities. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we've talked about it here previously, where almost forty percent um, of global oil is de- demanded by uh, by China. So I think the big story of the Chinese reopening, uh, the grand reopening, I think it's still playing out significantly, especially with agricultural commodities. Remember, China is really trying to move towards. Uh, a consumption-led growth. China has been on an export-led growth strategy for the last 40 years, and now they're moving towards a consumption-led, uh, domestic consumption-led strategy. So I think for the next couple of weeks, I think markets will still be, and if, if you look at the forecasts for China's GDP, it's really been around 5%, which is pretty impressive during a post-COVID um, environment. So I think a big part of that demand will be coming from countries like China. In fact, if you look at what the IMF chief economist said last week, that uh, China and India will contribute half of growth um, in 2023. So I think those two markets we need to pay extra attention to as we move forward. The big story as well in terms of uh, the US, they have lost. This actually is last week into this week, they recorded the, the biggest decline in terms of lending to about $150 billion. What could have been the factors that led to this kind of decline? Would it be the rise in interest hikes? Uh, what, what do you think would have made that the lending goes down that much? Well, obviously, when interest rates go up, uh, the cost of credit becomes more expensive. So even for a typical American family looking for a mortgage, you know, mortgage rates in America used to be about 2%, 3%. I was just seeing somebody getting at 5% um, mm-hmm. just last week. So it becomes harder and harder to be able to get that mortgage. And add, uh, because all these things are tied to your income, for example, right. and what you're qualified to. So I think it's just a natural demand cooling down. And that's what the Fed has been hoping to happen so that at least inflation um, starts coming down. China as well, There was um, they have just released the report in terms of their spend. The consumer index has actually stagnated. Inflation has slowed down. But then also the producer price index has really stalled year on year. Does China need a stimulus to boost their, con- their consumption with their, with, their, with their citizens? Or what kind, of, what kind of mitigating factors do they need to apply to kind of kickstart the economy once again? I think it's interesting, Danny, you've talked about the, the, the PPI, producer and the consumer. Mm-hmm. Because those are, tend to be uh, tell different narratives. Yes, mm. you know the mm. consumer is about the Chinese in Beijing, in Shanghai, uh, but the production that China does, you know, it does mm. global production. China is the workshop mm. of the world. Of the world. Mm. Yes. So those t- two indicators sometimes point to two very different realities. Mm. Uh, but if you look at um, the announcements that came in from the two sessions, this is you know China's really big announcement of where they want to be. It's very clear they're saying they'll be targeting 5% growth. Um, obviously, that will come with a bit of inflation. Um, the real estate segment has really been overheating. Um, China wants to sort of like see that coming down. You remember the whole evergreen um, situation mm, debacle, that played out. Yes. Uh, debacle. So I think they're very keen on uh, non-real estate uh, mm. development growth. This is just your ordinary Chinese person buying your iPhones and such things. I think that's what, and that's what makes America's economy very strong. America's economy is very consumption driven. Mm. Like almost 40% of their growth is consumption driven, uh, unlike China. So I think China is trying to slowly emulate um, the American economy because it's more sustainable, mm. consumption led growth. And I think those are the things that will be affecting the indicators moving forward. Now, the World Bank and the IMF, the spring meeting kicked off this week. And this meeting has kicked off in the face of lots of geopolitical tensions worldwide. 
Cable leaks show that Egypt ordered the production of 40,000 rockets to be shipped secretly to Russia. As you are well aware, Scotland just got its first, uh, its, its new first prime minister from Pakistan, which now brings in a whole dynamic within the United Kingdom because Rishi Sunak is from India. We already know how that relationship between India and Pakistan looks like. And then Joe Biden is making his way to Ireland to stoke up his Irish roots. But then yesterday there were huge demonstrations based off the Good Friday Accord in Northern Ireland. China seems to want to maroon Taiwan. What's the purpose of the spring meetings that are being held by the World Bank and the IMF? So one of the big reports that's been coming up in, on, uh, in front of the spring meetings has been by the IMF, really talking about how geopolitics is actually leading to geoeconomics. And the idea behind that is capital, capital that drives business, will start flowing among f- countries that are politically aligned, not necessarily geographically close. In fact, there's a term they came for it. I think they're calling it uh, friend shoring. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. where you really mm-hmm. capital, where you find the U.S. and Australia, which are worlds apart, worlds apart, but really a part of a network of countries that are interconnected more than Australia and China, which is which is next door. And I think it's a big term that's going to come up today, and it's increasing with those dynamics we've introduced. We're talking about, you know, Rishi Sunak, the Indian Prime Minister, son of a Kenyan, you know, Barack Obama was the son of a Kenyan. So we, we're becoming very, the diversity in the world it's creating these very interesting dynamics. And I think global geopolitics is changing and it's affecting geoeconomics. So even for Kenya, our geographical neighbors are Uganda and Tanzania. But you might find we are doing more business with U.S. than with Uganda.